Um, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, what an exciting meeting so far. Uh, I first wanted to uh, thank uh, the planning committee and organizing committee for such a wonderful uh, meeting so far. It's the first um, virtual meeting for Code Rouge, so it is it, it is like a very memorable meeting. Um, as we all know, bleeding disorder is a chronic condition that affects many aspects of the individual's life. Um, and in the care of the patients uh, and families with bleeding disorder, we are blessed to take benefit from a, uh, from numerous colleagues uh, with different skills. And among those, social workers are the ones that truly bring uh, humanity and compassion to our field. Uh, so I'm in delighted to invite you to our next session uh, where Stefan Branoff will lead an interview with uh, two women with bleeding disorders. Um, just as this uh, introduction, Stefan is the outpatient social worker in the Adult Bleeding Disorder Program at the London Health Science Center, Victoria Hospital in London, Ontario. In addition to working with uh, in his clinic role, he also provides support for patients uh, followed in outpatient medical clinic, including uh, adult cystic fibrosis program. As a member of the interdisciplinary team, Stefan provides counseling and resource resourcing support to both patients and their families who attend or are attached to the bleeding disorder program. On the top of his outpatient clinic work, Stefan dedicates a large portion of his time to working with inpatient medicine program. Over the past two years, Stefan had maintained his role as a co-chair of the Canadian Social Work in Hemophilia Care. And for two years, Stefan represented the social work body as the chair of London Health Sciences Centre Social Work Council. I'm certain that you will find this session very uh, delightful and fruitful and educational. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Amid. It's an absolute privilege to be a part of Code Rouge 2021, and particularly to share this platform with two amazing women, Joanna Halliday and Karen Fahey, who are here with me today and have agreed to share in their experience living with an inherited bleeding disorder. This is, however, not their first time um, sharing the platform at Code Rouge, as it should be noted that they both helped to pioneer the program back in 2012 as two of the first Code Rouge ambassadors. You can see them in this photo sitting beside each other in the front row some nine years ago. And here today, they sit uh, beside each other virtually, albeit, um, to continue their commitment to advocate for women with bleeding disorders. Joanna Halliday is a patient, a CHS volunteer, and ad an advocate for women with bleeding disorders. She's a mother of two daughters who also share her type 2 von Willebrand disease diagnosis. Her husband, Joel, completes their family unit, and they all enjoy board games and traveling to the mountains. Karen Fahey lives with a rare inherited bleeding disorder, Factor 7. In her professional life, she's a business development manager for the personal safety division with 3M. Her role with the company is to lead, motivate, and energize stakeholders to focus on aligning health and safety management priorities to 3M solutions. She is a wife and a mother of two young women. Her background and family history of bleeding issues has led her to be an active volunteer with the CHS, its Quebec chapter, and the World Federation of Hemophilia since 2010. Karen continuously seeks to find creative ways to increase awareness and access care for individuals living with a bleeding disorder. So together we will explore beyond their diagnoses, specifically how their lives have been impacted along the way and what challenges they have encountered. So thank you both for being here today. I think we uh, all hope to be sitting together in person with a cup of coffee in hand, but COVID-19 had other plans. So uh, good morning, ladies. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning there, Joanna. And, and I thought we might first start by uh, chatting a bit about each of your lives living with respective bleeding disorders. So Joanna, would you mind describing your bleeding disorder and how you manage it and maybe when you were diagnosed? Sure, good morning. I was diagnosed uh, with von Willebrand's disease. Um, at that time, uh, I was two years old. Um, and so we didn't have a lot of the uh, 
understanding of von Willebrand's that we do today. Um, so back then I was just uh, diagnosed with von Willebrand's. We now know that I have von Willebrand's type 2. And um, I find uh, the management of my disorder um, has helped by going on a home prophylaxis uh, treatment program um, for certain seasons of my life. Uh, I also take tranexamic acid um, and um, then every so often need just a little bit more care from my HTC um, and a few other uh, medications to, to round that out to help, um, such as birth control or um, things to help uh, control my period or to control um, different, you know, swelling or, or bruises or um, different things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. And, and I'd imagine that it's taken quite some time to come to that place where you're, you feel comfortable. Maybe you've found the regimen that works for you um, over the course of many years. Yeah, I, th I think Von Willebrand, it's interesting in so many aspects, but really, um, you know, it changes throughout your lifetime. It changes through uh, the different seasons of life. And so um, I think we kind of enter in these different seasons and then you kind of have to figure out what's the new thing that we've got to uh, got to get a hold of or or have got to uh, deal with or, or control. Um, I think Von Willebrand's is uh, sometimes a little bit sneaky and um, can, can get you when you're just not expecting it. And sure. so uh, that's where things like preparation and, and um, things like just exploring and, and uh, researching a little bit can, can also really help. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, if I see Karen, if Karen, if you're, you're here with us, I might ask you to maybe share a little bit about your bleeding disorder and, and how it's managed and when you were diagnosed. Absolutely. Um, so I, I'm a late bloomer. So I was officially diagnosed much later, much later in life uh, and received my official diagnosis of my uh, factor seven rare inherited bleeding disorder uh, just shy of uh, two years ago. But uh, I have a, a dad and a brother who um, exhibited throughout their life uh, bleeding disorder. So we spent a good part of my childhood looking for a diagnosis for them while on the sidelines, however, I was, you know, exhibiting real serious issues with my period, um, similar bruising uh, to that of my uh, father and my brother. Um, but at that time, so if you rewind, uh, you know, a good, uh, I'm, I'm 55 now, so the, the project started, I was eight years old. So back then, you know, a woman with a bleeding disorder or a girl with a bleeding disorder, it was you know, it was really being dismissed a lot. So, you know, the day-to-day, -day, I, do, I don't require uh, any form of infusion. It really is in, in times of intervention. Um, but throughout, <clears throat> throughout my life, though, um, I did have to deal with severe uh, menstrual bleeding, which did lead to um, a hysterectomy, uh, evidently, because my life had become almost dysfunctional because of the amount of bleeding that I was having on a monthly basis. There were things that were tried, and we tried um, uh, an IUD with uh, Depoprova Provera that was in it. So we, we did do that. Um, I did injections for a number of years until, until it was... Um, recommended that we stop with the monthly injections and then we had moved to the IUD, which then really led to, to a hysterectomy. But all in all, it's, for me, it's been, um, it's been a journey of discovery, a journey of frustration, which led me to this cause because I saw the importance of advocating for women living with bleeding disorders. What if, what if there were others like me and here they are battling trying to converse with the medical community to be understood. But in the meantime, we were suffering and even our family members didn't understand. I'll be honest, even maybe my mom and dad were like thinking I was over exaggerating my situation. Yeah, I mean, and, and thank you for, for sharing. And, and you certainly touch on a lot of the uh, challenges and barriers and obstacles that women may face when yeah. um, 
coping with an inherited bleeding disorder. And, and we're definitely going to explore that further as we continue on. But um, but one thing I, I thought this may be a good opportunity to steer down the street and talk about quality of life. As you speak of these challenges, you know, sometimes the process of being diagnosed and finding the finding the right regimen or determining appropriate treatment can be much smoother. And in, in your case, as you describe it, it was not at all. No. Um, and I'd imagine that that would have had uh, quite the impact on your quality of life. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, um, when you talk about the quality of life, you got to put it in context in the phases of my life, right? So young woman, that's one thing. And I'll be candid, you're dating, you have a period, you're, you're concerned about things. And you're at a point in your life where you're discovering who you are, you're, you're trying to make impressions, you're, you're that young, eager person and you feel held back by it and it creates a great amount of insecurity. Um, then you move into, you know, adulthood. Okay, I think I got a handle of all this stuff. You know, things are being managed, and that goes on for a period of time. Then motherhood comes into play, and now you're married, and now you have children. But in my case, my situation was getting progressively worse. So what happens with these bleeds is now I'm anemic. I have a full-time job, I'm a mother, I'm exhausted every day, I don't understand, I'm not diagnosed, I can't cope, coping leads to stress, stress was making my bleeds worse, so it became until, you know, I was really getting the conversations going, which was probably in my late 30s, early 40s, when I started getting a footing on the conversations with the medical community and feeling that I was getting some form of support that was giving me motivation to keep going and, and you know, finding a way to cope and deal with this, um, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's really kind of a, and, and there's a lot. I mean, we could probably talk till, till tomorrow morning, especially, you know, if we sit down and make it a relaxed setting, there's a lot that we can share, but um, that, that's kind of yeah. what the challenges were living with it. Yeah, and, and I appreciate you highlighting the different phases and seasons of life because, you know, that looks different for everyone, but each phase and season brings about new responsibility and there's uh, an inherited bleeding disorder there through every season that you're coping with. And um, we'll, we'll definitely, that's, I'm glad you brought up the career component and maybe we'll chat about that a little bit later, but I want to continue on with um, the impact of the bleeding disorder. And, and Joanna, you know, we acknowledge the impact and the challenge that each bleeding disorder can have. And, and you touched on uh, family, um, you know, so my question is how, how specifically has it impacted your family and your social life and, and the relationships that you maintain within them? Well, I think the first thing when I when I think about family and how it's impacted my family, the first thing I think about is, of course, my family. Um, my family has a huge prevalence of von Willebrand's disease. So my grandmother was diagnosed first and they said, you need to bring in your family because it's inherited. And at that point in time, all of her children and all of her grandchildren were diagnosed. And since then, both my children have been diagnosed. So um, I'm actually pretty blessed in that a large portion of my family have a similar disorder to me. Um, now, even though we all have von Willebrand's disease, a lot of us uh, experience symptoms in different ways. So one thing that works for one of us doesn't always work uh, for everyone, or it, it doesn't often work for everyone. Um, and so I think it's very interesting to see just in one family how different Von Willebrands can be from patient to patient um, and situation to situation. I think, too, the thing that I think about is my different family members. I'm very blessed in that, you know, I had a, I had a mother growing up who, um, you know, when she found out we had this disorder throughout growing up and, and, and early adulthood, she, uh, she was very involved in the CHS. She would do research and she would 
you know, uh, talk to doctors and, and be very up on all the new medical discoveries to try to help me sort of through this journey. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think about my husband, um, who, of course, it affects, you know, as Karen uh, alluded to, it affects your partner. Um, it affects intimacy with your partner. Um, it affects uh, just different things that you can do with your partner. And, uh, you know, Karen, Karen talked about anemia. And I think probably... I, I agree in that in that sort of college range, the anemia that I was experiencing really cut into my social life. Um, I think I, I needed to sleep literally all the time. Um, I didn't feel like myself. I felt lethargic and I'm tired, you know, and so that that kind of cuts into that those friendships and those relationships and the dating and and uh, trying to establish uh even a great school schedule or a great school school life, that kind of thing. And of course, when I think about family, I think about family planning. Um, when my husband and I uh, sort of embarked on, we would like to have children, um, but how do I come off all of these drugs that I'm on to control my period so that I can have a baby? Um, so there was sort of navigating those waters. Um, and then of course, when my daughters were born, uh, there's several issues when you're when you're facing um birth and uh, i had a c-section with both of them and so that was of course a, a surgery on top of um also kind of giving birth and um so with several or uh, with both of them i spent several extra days in hospital um severe bruising, um, doctors not really being able to tell if it's an infection or bruise or, you know, uh, there's a lot of sort of gray areas there trying to do that. And then um, I think, you know, back to when we were family planning, after I had my second daughter, um, like Karen, my condition was just it was taking over my life. It was getting worse. Um, and after I had my second daughter, things were getting really uncontrollable. And my husband and I had to face the decision, okay, do we instantly have another child? Um, or do I choose to go a medical intervention route and have a uterine ablation? Um, and at that time, I just felt, I felt so exhausted. And I, I couldn't I couldn't imagine how I can take care of the daughters that I do have um, into having more children. And so uh, we chose at that time, um, which was the right decision in the end. We have a perfect family, but, um, you know, uh, to, to have a uterine ablation and to just, but to be, you know, to sort of face those, to face face that that impacts life you know and, and impacts it it pushes timetables and it um you know it it pushes you into these these sort of larger life decisions um with your partner and your family so Absolutely. i think that's probably the the ways that it's um the most impacted my family or my social life mm-hmm. and what a comprehensive uh, outline of your life trajectory really is is uh, Karen had started to talk about the different seasons is one would age with a bleeding disorder the challenges that accompany it and um, really questions and decisions that most don't have to consider and most wouldn't know you mentioned um, you know through college feel you know needing to sleep and I, you know, I imagine many in your life would wonder why and 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 having those conversations so, so that just kind of scratches the surface on, um, you know, some of those challenges. Um, And as we've spent some time talking about each of your journeys, you know, I'd presume that we've really only begun to peel away a few layers of your individual experiences. And I do believe we could continue to learn so much more from your personal testimonies. Uh, But I also feel that we could learn from the vision and hope that you have for the future care of women who are diagnosed with bleeding disorders. So as we acknowledge some of the barriers that women with bleeding disorders encounter, and and we've discussed them earlier in this program, such as having a diagnosis, being diagnosed, having a voice, being validated, or only being regarded as carriers, uh, Karen, might, might you be able to talk a little bit about future hopes that you might have for treatment and care? Yeah, well, I have a couple hopes because, you know, you mentioned about uh, Joanna and I, you know, really embarking on this journey um, back in 2012. Um, I embarked on this journey 
out of my hospital room with Dr. Winnikoff. So I, I am extremely honored. This is this is how I pay it forward is by by doing this. But more importantly, my vision is that we don't have to be the women don't have to find themselves in a situation where they're real, well, having to kind of put their fist on the counter to, to kind of get heard and they can't suffer in in silence. So we need more people like Joanna and I advocating and being leaders in this space. The more voices we are, the more attention we get and the more attention we get, you know, the ripple effect happens and the conversations are happening. I would hope that we can have a lot more conversations moving forward and that conversations go beyond a cadre rouge. I most recently, for the very first time, found the courage, and I use the key word courage here, to uh, give a talk about my story at work. And um, what came out of that totally inspired me to, to push even further because there were women out of there that got diagnosed from that session. Um, there were aha moments for the men. It's important for the men to also get involved in these conversations as well. They have wives, they have daughters, they have mothers, they have sisters. And sometimes we need their voice to advocate for us when we, we need care. If, if I can't you know, advocate for myself in an emergency situation, I need either my husband or whomever I'm with. I travel for work. So my husband's not always by my side. So I have to have, I have to expand kind of my care network to people outside that can understand enough to advocate for me when in need. So really moving forward, key for me is, is these conversations um, need to expand uh, beyond, you know, limited forums and, and to include dialogues uh, with men as well so that we get a full comprehension of what we go through. And I certainly accept and validate that as a man. I, I agree with you. And uh, as you speak to the importance of really, it starts with being a self-advocate, which is what both of you have had to do. You've had to advocate for yourselves and uh, reach out to the support systems that you have. So Joanna, as we kind of settled there, how can we, how can we engage the healthcare community to further be a part of this change? Oh, I think that's such an important question, Stephen. I think, um, <clears throat> I think uh, for, from a patient perspective, I think being involved in organizations like the Canadian Hemophilia Society, like uh, the World Federation, um, you know, advocating for um, better care, advocating for women's clinics, advocating uh, for our HTCs and um, getting to know our doctors and nurses and helping the, helping the doctors and nurses understand that there is a force out there. There's a force of patients who want to fight for them um, as well. And uh, that it's our care when cutbacks happen or when uh, changes in our clinics happen um, those things affect us the most <laughs> and um, it affects our care and it affects when we can get emergent care, when things pop up that we're not expecting. Um, we need we need those resources uh, to be there. And so I think um, as patients, we need to rise up and be advocates. We need to join organizations that are fighting for these things um, with our HTCs, we need to join with our doctors and nurses, um, writing letters to our MLAs or to our governments, you know, voting for parties that uh, will be uh, there looking out for our health um, and to support our diagnosis, to support our treatments, to support the medications that we take um, and the organizations that, that make them. So I think that's important. Absolutely. And, and I think that really um, outlines uh, an action plan moving forward uh, where the healthcare community collaborates with, with patients, with female patients and advocates and support of, supports alike. And I also think it's predicated 
on women having a safe environment to speak about their bleeding disorder, which is again, something I'm really pulling away from this conversation. And while it's changing, there's still quite a ways to go, which is also something that I'm hearing. So so I acknowledge and validate that. And you, you have both kind of touched on what we might narrow down to three main pillars, which would, which would be um, education, awareness, communication, and this all in relation to more effectively diagnosing and supporting women with a bleeding disorder. So Karen, could you briefly just maybe expand on on those pillars? Oh, geez. There's, sorry, my, my uh, communication system is falling out my hair. I do have tape holding in. It's failing me. Um, <laughs> you know, there's just, uh, I'm, I'm trying to take it all in and absorb how I can expand. There's just, there's just so much that can be done. And I think we're kind of covering all of it here. You know, the key is the collaboration how do you build awareness and how do you how do you contribute in uh, joining different communities so that you can you know it's fun like, like we were just talking actually earlier today coming here in the car how much work there is you know join a woman's committee outline kind of what are the immediate needs and what are the the mandates in the short term and then action them it, it's easy. It's easy to build a plan, and it's easy to, you know, lay out kind of the focus areas, or like you say a moment ago, the, the pillars. But actioning it is is the most difficult part. You you need people, you need resources, you need funding, you know. So um, don't know if I'm answering your question there, but but there, there's just so much that can be brought forward to expand on all those pillars. Absolutely, and, and really, um, as you mentioned, it's something we could talk about all day. Um, it's hard to briefly cover that, and, and we certainly have covered a lot of ground here today. And, um, you know, the takeaway is that we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And we've started the conversation, but it, it needs to continue. And uh, whether it be considering a diagnosis and, and that process, or living with in that process, or preparing and growing, um, you know, this field, is another process and and I think um, this here helps to start that conversation so um, I, I wanted to also bring I wanted to bring this here towards the end and, and close it out on a more personal note and ask that if each of you could share a message of hope and wisdom uh, to your daughters to your family or even uh, other uh, women and, and girls who have uh, diagnoses of uh, bleeding disorders um, as they take on life with this diagnosis, what would that message be, Joanna? Wow, that's such a great question. Um, I think what I would want to tell my daughters is uh, to keep fighting, keep fighting for better care. I'm going to fight for better care, um, and that we shouldn't shrink away from uh, when we're having issues. And also to not, um, you know, Karen spoke about um, being a woman with a bleeding disorder. Sometimes, uh, you know, it used to be that men had bleeding disorders. Uh, women didn't. Um, but we knew that there was all these women bleeding. And um, I think that's kind of ingrained in our society and our culture is that uh, we don't want to inconvenience <laughs> You know, um, as a as a mother or as a as a as a woman, uh, you don't want to you don't want to st stop your your day or stop your family or stop your planning. But um, self care and advocacy and uh, caring for yourself uh, when you're bleeding is um, going to it's important. It's the most important thing to make sure that your overall health is taken care of um, and to make sure that you um, that you take care of yourself by um, having having that awareness of your bleeding disorder and making sure that you're preparing for all the little different things that are coming along, uh, making sure you're talking to your HTC. If you have a, a small procedure coming up, a small procedure can become a huge procedure um, if uh, if your bleeding disorder isn't in check. And sure. so, you know, um, just 
gaining that knowledge that you need of yourself and your bleeding disorder um, is really important. And I think that we have more tools now. Um, there's been tools developed uh, by by the medical community, by CHS, by by those different things. And so just being becoming aware of those tools and accessing them, Accessing your HTC and and asking the questions that are um, important and and asking the questions to make sure that you're really taking care of yourself um, is a step in the right direction. Oh, such wise words. And again, uh, reinforcing the importance of being a self-advocate, but also uh, reaching out and accepting support from the systems around you. Um, so that those are great words, and and Karen, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, would you what message would you have? Well, for, I already have those messages. Yeah, I, I actually we actually discuss it quite often, and what I tell them is um, embrace your uniqueness. You know, this is something that you can uh, coddle and lead with and add to your wheel basket. There couldn't be a better time for women to speak up on women leadership. And what I tell my daughters is, you know what? If you talk about it, if you lead, others will follow and you won't be alone. So encourage others to dialogue, encourage others to be curious. Don't get too caught up in the weeds. I've got one daughter who's diagnosed. I've got another daughter who's, we're, we're not kind of, kind of sure what's going on, but we're evaluating. So it's kind of like two different scenarios. But I said, build the curiosity. Don't get caught up in the weeds. Don't get caught up in the details. But understand what your reality is. Everybody's reality is different. Joanna spoke about just within her family how things are different for each member of the family that has uh, Von Willebrand. In my household, there's my brother, there's my father, there's myself. I'm the only woman in my, my unit other than my daughter, Alana. But the three girls, we have different scenarios that are going on. My, my journey is different than Alana's journey. So we have to share the journeys um, because from that there's learnings is what I, what I tell them. So it's not cookie cutter. And by sharing, everybody else gets another tool in their toolkit. So um, that's, that's really the message as I give is embrace it, talk about it, be curious and lead the way so others can can follow. And and I'm proud of them. They've done they've done a good job. They both have had uh, scenarios where they had to deal with challenges uh, on their own, and um, they they found their way. And I've had to learn to let go. I've had to say, you're going to go see the physician on your own now. You're 22 or you're 27. Mommy can't be there anymore. You got to be able to advocate on your own. So I've had to teach them that, teach them what cues are, teach them how to have the conversation. Don't get bitter, don't get angry. You have to open up the dialogue. So that's kind of that's kind of the messaging that I that I leave my daughters for their future. Oh wow, and and again also wise words and Speaking to our title, Beyond the Diagnosis, we may see the, the title and the label of a diagnosis, but for every woman, it's different and, and the experience is different and, and uh, your daughters are, are lucky to, to have you as a mother who has demonstrated such resiliency and has transitioned through so many seasons and uh, accomplished much in your career as well that they, they are probably inspired by your story. And, and again, those are very wise words. So hearing both of your stories, I can only begin to appreciate um, what your lives have been like living with your bleeding disorder, which is why we, we must carry that conversation forward and continue to advocate for change. I do believe that conferences such as uh, this one, Code Rouge represents an important an encouraging and a hopeful step in that direction. And, and today we're grateful for both of your, uh, your testimonies, the bravery and the vulnerability that you shared today. Thank you both for your time. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. Of course, and we'll transition here to the Q&A portion of the session and look to the listeners to see if they have any questions. And I don't know that, um, there are any popping up yet. So, no, okay. I think we still have a few minutes. Um, 
so I might just leave it uh, leave it to either of you if you had any closing remarks here. Again, we covered quite a bit of ground and uh, didn't really get to, to dig too deep. But was there anything that you wanted to share with this platform that um, we as listeners or healthcare providers, um, you know, you feel that we may need to hear? Mm. Either Joanna or Karen. I'm trying. You to, go ahead, Karen. I'm, yeah, <laughs> throw yeah, throw the ball my way. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to think. Well, you know what? How about how about I take it? I'm I'm going to take it a couple step back because I, to the community that we're speaking to today, maybe the message I would give. To focus on an area where I found as a woman, and even I found with my daughters, was the most challenging with their bleeding disorder was focusing on um, the gynecology, right? So when they would meet with a physician, you know, for the first couple of times and having those conversations, those, those I think, that's our entry for the young girls to the medical community for the most part on their own, right? When they, whether they're going in for their first checkup, right? Or they're going in, um, they're gonna contemplate, um, um, birth control, do you know what I mean? Like that, that stage is critical in their lives. So I probably would um, throw that out there to, to, for those that are able to enable dialogue with gynecology is understand that that is a pivotal point for those young women. It's as pivotal for the medical community as it is for uh, the patient because that is where you try to figure out where to direct because that, that child in Quebec, if you're 14 years old, you're, you're going in on your own, right? So that person is going to try to have a conversation. So it's important that the physician, you know, understands if there's certain key words that are coming out of that child that we got cues. Obviously, you know, the parents in us, like for myself with my daughters, you know, I, I equip them with that. But it may not always be the case. They may not always have a, a Karen or a Joanna as a mom, a sister, or a grandmother that, that is helping them along. So I probably would just throw that on the table and say, I look at that as being the entry to those initial dialogues from a patient standpoint. Absolutely, and again, that that's, speaks and underscores the importance of engaging the healthcare community, and as you mentioned, the physicians. So I hope we can take that forward today and start that and start doing that. Um, so I think we're out of time, but uh, I thank you both very much. This has been a great privilege to chat with you uh, today, and I wish we had more time. I wish we were together in person, uh, and, and I hope that we can uh, do that in the future. So thank you again very much. Yeah, just call if you Thank want. You. Just call me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will. Thank you.